Looking for a new field of research, I asked Professor Stoll to let me continue the investigations on the alkaloids of ergot, which he had begun in 1917 and which had led directly to the isolation of ergotamine in 1918. Ergotamine, discovered by Stoll, was the first ergot alkaloid obtained in pure chemical form. Although ergotamine quickly took a significant place in therapeutics as a hemostatic remedy in obstetrics and as a medicine in the treatment of migraine, chemical research on ergot at the Sandoz laboratories was abandoned after the isolation of ergotamine and the determination of its empirical formula. Meanwhile, at the beginning of the 30s, English and American laboratories had begun to determine the chemical structure of ergot alkaloids. They had also discovered a new, water-soluble ergot alkaloid which could likewise be isolated from the mother liquor of ergotamine production. So I thought it was high time that the Sandoz resumed chemical research on ergot alkaloids unless we wanted to risk losing our leading role in a field of medicinal research that was already becoming so important. Professor Stoll granted my request with some misgivings. Quote, I must warn you of the difficulties you face in working with ergot alkaloids. These are exceedingly sensitive, easily decomposed substances, less stable than any of the compounds you've investigated in the cardiac glycoside field, but you are welcome to try." End quote. And so the switches were thrown and I found myself engaged in a field of study that would become the main theme of my professional career. I have never forgotten the creative joy, the eager anticipation I felt in embarking on the study of ergot alkaloids, at that time a relatively uncharted field of research. It may be helpful here to give some background information about ergot itself. It is produced by a lower fungus that grows parasitically on rye and to a lesser extent on other species of grain and on wild grasses. Kernels infested with this fungus develop into light brown to violet brown curved pegs that push forth from the husk in place of normal grains. Ergot is described botanically as scleroteum, the form that the ergot fungus takes in the winter. Ergot of rye is the variety used medicinally. Ergot, more than any other drug, has a fascinating history in the course of which its role and meaning have been reversed. Once dreaded as a poison, in the course of time is become a rich storehouse of valuable remedies. Ergot first appeared on the stage of history in the early Middle Ages as the cause of outbreaks of mass poisonings affecting thousands of people at a time. The illness, whose connection with ergot was for a long time obscure, appeared in two characteristic forms, one gangrious and the other convulsive. Popular names for ergotism, such as mal des ardents, ignis sacer, Heligis fewer, or St. Anthony's fire, refer to the gangrious form of the disease. The patron saint of ergotism victims was St. Anthony, and it was primarily the order of St. Anthony that treated these patients. Until recent times, epidemic-like outbreaks of ergot poisoning have been recorded in most of European countries, including certain areas of Russia. With progress in agriculture and since the realization in the 17th century that ergot-containing bread was the cause, the frequency and extent of ergotism epidemics diminished considerably. The last great epidemic occurred in certain areas of southern Russia in the years 1926 through 27. The first mention of a medicinal use of ergot, namely as an ekbalik, or a medicament to precipitate childbirth, is found in the herbal of Frankfurt city physician Adam Lonitzer in the year 1582. Although ergot, as Lonitzer stated, had been used since olden times by midwives, it was not until 1808 that this drug gained entry into academic medicine, on the strength of a work by the American physician John Stearns entitled Account of the Putvis Parturians, a remedy for quickening childbirth. The use of ergot as an ekbalik did not, however, endure. Practitioners became aware quite early of the great danger to the child, owing primarily to the uncertainty of the dosage, which when too high, led to uterine spasms. From then on, the use of ergot in obstetrics was confined to stopping postpartum hemorrhage. It was not until ergot's recognition in various pharmacopias during the first half of the 19th century that the first steps were taken toward isolating the active principles of the drug. However, all of the researchers who essayed this problem during the first hundred years, not one succeeded in identifying the actual substances responsible for the therapeutic activity. 
In 1907, the Englishmen G. Barger and F. H. Carr were the first to isolate an active alkaloidal preparation which they named ergotoxin because it produced more of the toxic than therapeutic properties of ergot. This preparation was not homogeneous, but rather a mixture of several alkaloids, as I was able to show 35 years later. Nevertheless, the pharmacologist H. H. Dale discovered that ergotoxin, besides the uterotonic effects, also had an antagonistic activity on adrenaline in the autonomic nervous system that could lead to the therapeutic use of ergot alkaloids. Only with the isolation of ergotamine by A. Stoll, as mentioned previously, did an ergot alkaloid find entry and widespread use in therapeutics. The early 1930s brought a new era in ergot research, beginning with the determination of the chemical structure of ergot alkaloids, as mentioned in English and American laboratories. By chemical cleavage, W. A. Jacobs and L. C. Craig of the Rockefeller Institute of New York succeeded in isolating and characterizing the nucleus common to all ergot alkaloids. They named it lysergic acid. Then came a major development both for chemistry and for medicine. The isolation of the specifically urotonic hemostatic principle of ergot, which was published simultaneously and quite independently by four institutions, including the Sandoz Laboratories. The substance, an alkaloid of comparatively simple structure, was named ergobazine by A. Stoll and E. Burkhardt. By the chemical degradation of ergobazine, W. A. Jacobs and L. C. Craig obtained lysergic acid and the amino alcohol propanolamine as cleavage products. I set as my first goal the problem of preparing this alkaloid synthetically through chemical linking of the two components of ergobazine, lysergic acid and propanolamine. The lysergic acid necessary for these studies had to be obtained by chemical cleavage of some other ergot alkaloid, since only ergotamine was available as pure alkaloid and was already being produced in kilogram quantities in the pharmaceutical production department. I chose this alkaloid as the starting material for my work. I set about obtaining half a gram of ergotamine from the ergot production people. When I sent the internal requisition form to Professor Stoll for his counter signature, he appeared in my laboratory and reproved me. If you want to work with ergot alkaloids, you will have to familiarize yourself with the techniques of microchemistry. I can't have you consuming such a large amount of my expensive ergotamine for your experiments. The ergot production department, besides using ergot of Swiss origin to obtain ergotamine, also dealt with Portuguese ergot, which yielded an amorphous alkaloidal preparation that corresponded to the aforementioned ergotoxin first produced by Barger and Carr. I decided to use this less expensive material for the preparation of lysergic acid. The alkaloid obtained from the production department had to be purified further before it would be suitable for cleavage to lysergic acid. Observations made during the purification process led me to think that ergotoxin could be a mixture of several alkaloids rather than one homogeneous alkaloid. I will speak later of the far-reaching sequel of these observations. Here I must digress briefly to describe the working conditions and techniques that prevailed in those days. These remarks may be of interest to the present generation of research chemists in industry who are accustomed to far better conditions. We were very frugal. Individual laboratories were considered a rare extravagance. During the first six years of my employment with Sandoz, I shared a laboratory with two colleagues. We three chemists, plus an assistant each, worked in the same room on three different fields. Dr. Kreiss on cardiac glycosides, Dr. Weidemann, who joined Sandoz around the same time as I, on the leaf pigment chlorophyll, and I, ultimately on ergot alkaloids. The laboratory was equipped with two fume hoods, providing less than effective ventilation by gas flames. When we requested that these hoods be equipped with ventilators, our chief refused on the ground that ventilation by gas flame had sufficed in Willstetter's laboratory. During the last years of World War I, Professor Stoll had been an assistant in Berlin and Munich 
to the world-famous chemist and Nobel laureate professor Richard Wilster, and with him had conducted the fundamental investigations on chlorophyll and the assimilation of carbon dioxide. There was scarcely a scientific discussion with Professor Stoll in which he did not mention his revered teacher, Professor Wilstetter, and his work in Wilstetter's laboratory. The working techniques available to chemists in the field of organic chemistry at that time, which was the beginning of the 30s, were essentially the same as those employed by Justus von Liebig a hundred years earlier. The most important development achieved since then was the introduction of microanalysis by B. Pregel, which made it possible to ascertain the elemental composition of a compound with only a few milligrams of specimen, whereas earlier a few centigrams were needed. Of the other physical chemical techniques at the disposal of the chemist today, techniques which have changed his way of working, making it faster and more effective, and created entirely new possibilities, above all for the ludication of structure, none yet existed in those days. For the investigations of glycosides and the first studies in the ergot field, I still used the old separation and purification techniques from Liebig's day. Fractional extraction, fractional precipitation, fractional crystallization, and the like. The introduction of column chromatography, the first important step in modern laboratory technique, was of great value to me only in later investigations. For structure determination, which today can be conducted rapidly and elegantly with help of spectroscopic methods and X-ray crystallography, we had to rely in the first fundamental ergot studies entirely on the old laborious methods of chemical degradation and derivation.